and December. Well, I have a following true story from another pastor, and uh, he tells a story about his, da- his three-year-old daughter, Rena, and he said that she sat with us during a baptismal service last Sunday night, and he was the associate pastor, and he said this was a new experience for her, and she exclaimed in surprise, she said, Dad, why he pushed that guy in the water? <laughs> why he pushed that guy in the water? Why, Dad, why? And my wife tried to explain briefly and quietly, but Rena just wouldn't be satisfied. So later that night, we tried to provide an answer that a child's mind could comprehend. And we talked about sin and and told Rena that when people decide to live for Jesus and do good, they want everyone to know. And we then explained that water symbolized Jesus washing people from sin. And when they come out clean, they're going to try to be good. And a moment later, we realized we'd have to work on our explanation a bit because Rena immediately responded, well, Dad, why didn't Pastor Bob just spank him? If that's why he was. So, you know, not a bad question. You know, sin, which we're talking about today, is, is at, at, the, at the heart of it, it is breaking God's law. It is breaking the moral code of who God is. It's doing something that is opposite of who God is and what he has established for it. And, and sin is the reason that Jesus came. It's the reason we worship Jesus because we've all sinned and we all needed a savior from that. But, but sin is often much more serious than many of us often realize. So today we're looking about what happens when we sin and what can we do about it when that happens. It's not just a guilt sermon, but it's an issue of what can we do about it when it happens. And it'll show us this. And so we are in 1 Samuel chapter 22, starting in verse 6. Very interesting story here. Uh, if you've been following along with this, if not, you'll have the idea what's happening when we, when we start in verse 6, where David is fleeing King Saul. King Saul was trying to kill him out of jealousy. And David had gone in, in to this priestly city of, of Nob, and, and he had lied about why he was there, but he received help and God protected him. Verse 6. Now when Saul heard that David was discovered and the men who were with him, Saul was sitting at Gebeah under the tamarisk tree on the height with his spear in his hand. And all his servants were standing about him. And Saul said to his servants who stood about him, Here now, people of Benjamin, will the son of Jesse give every one of you fields and vineyards? Will he make you all commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds? That all of you have conspired against me? No one discloses to me when my son makes a covenant with the son of Jesse. None of you is sorry for me or discloses to me that my son has stirred up my servant against me to lie in wait as at this day. Then answered Doeg the Edomite who stood by the servants of Saul said, I saw the son of Jesse coming to Nob to Ahimelech the son of Ahitub. And he inquired of the Lord for him and gave him provisions and gave him the sword of Goliath the Philistine. Verse 11. Then the king sent to summon Ahimelech the priest, the son of Ehitub, and all his father's house, the priest who were at Nob, and all of them came to the king. And Saul said, Hear now, son of Ahitub. And he answered, Here I am, my lord. And Saul said to him, Why have you conspired against me? You and the son of Jesse, in that you have given him bread and a sword and have inquired of God for him so that he has risen against me to lie in wait as at this day. Then Ahimelech answered the king, and who among all your servants is so faithful as David? Who is the king's son-in-law and captain over your bodyguard and honored in your house? Is today the first time that I have inquired of God for him? No, let not the king impute anything to his servant or to all the house of my father, for your servant has known nothing of all this, much or little. Verse 16. And the king said, You shall surely die, Ahimelech, you and all your father's house. And the king said to the guard who stood about him, Turn and kill the priests of the Lord, because their hand also is with David. And they knew that he fled and did not disclose it to me. But the servants of the king would not put out their hand to strike the priests of the Lord. Then the king said to Doeg, you turn and strike the priests. And Doeg the Edomite turned and struck down the priest, and he killed on that day 85 persons 
who wore the linen ephod. And Nob, the city of the priests, he put to the sword both man and woman, child and infant, ox, donkey, and sheep he put to the sword. Verse 20. But one of the sons of Ahimelech, the son of Ahitub, named Abiathar, escaped. And he fled after David. And Abiathar told David that Saul had killed the priests of the Lord. And David said to Abiathar, I knew on that day when Doeg the Edomite was there that he would surely tell Saul, I have occasioned the death of all the persons of your father's house. Stay with me. Do not be afraid, for he who seeks my life seeks your life. With me you shall be in safe keeping. Heavenly Father, as we look at this passage today, we see two men, really, Lord. We see Saul, Father, who you have shown to us is, is a man that, that was falling further and further into sin. And we see David, Lord, your, your chosen Savior for your people at this time, who also sinned, wasn't as severe, but was also guilty. Lord, show us today in this passage the consequences of when we sin, Lord. What, what, what occurs when that happens? And then, Lord, show us what we can do about it, where we can go, where we can run, so that we can have forgiveness, Lord. Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who offers these things to us. Lord, I pray that my words reflect your heart as written in your word today. May you fill me with your spirit today as I preach your word. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to show you today three realities of sin today. Three realities of sin. Number one, our sin has consequence. Our sin has consequence. Verse 6, it says that when Saul heard that David was discovered and that he had men with him, Saul's worst fears have come true. David had assembled an army, and according to Saul, apparently was planning to attack the throne. Now, we know this wasn't true. David was on the run, and God provided for him shelter and food, even though David lied as to why he needed it to the people that God gave it to him. He provided it. He even provided him 400 men who could be with him and provide protection for him. He was in exile, and God was protecting David, but the neurotic Saul misinterpreted the facts and makes horrible decisions as a result. It says that he was sitting at Gebeah under this tree and he had his spear in his hand. Now maybe, he, maybe that was just symbolic. Maybe he was about to use it. That was his preferred weapon. And he had his servants around him. And Saul said to his servants, now hear now people of Benjamin. Saul was a Benjamite. And so his tribe was around him. And he says, will this son of Jesse, David, is he going to give you the vineyards? Is he going to uh, make your bellies full? Is he, is he going to be loyal to you? Is he going to give you the job promotions? Is he going to do all these things for you? If so, th then why have you conspired against me? Now, they've done nothing against him. Saul is not in reality. His jealousy, his neurosis, has him thinking about things that aren't happening. Chasing ghosts, chasing smoke. That's what sin does. It leads us down a path of fear. And, and, he, and he says, you're, you're being disloyal to me. And he says, no one tells me, verse nine, 8, when my son makes a covenant with David. None of you is sorry for me. No, no one tells me that my son has stirred up my servant to lie away. No one feels sorry for King Saul. No one feels his pain. He's the victim. The problem is he's not a victim of anything. He's only a victim of the creation of his own mind. But he feels no pity. How often do we hear this kind of thing in our own culture today? No one feels sorry for me. I mean, there's nothing wrong. Saul takes absolutely no responsibility for his own actions, blames David and everyone in his kingdom for all the problems in his own life. But there was a man named Doeg who wasn't even Israelite. He was an Edomite. He was loyal to Saul, and he gives them more information. In verse 9, Doeg said, 
I saw David, the son of Jesse, and he came to Ahimelech, and he inquired of the Lord, and guess what, Saul, you won't believe it? He gave him provisions, and he gave him Goliath's sword. Can you believe that? So in the previous passage, we had learned that the priestly city of Nob gave David food. He gave him weapons. Gave him, I guess he came with nothing because he was on exile. Gave him safe passage. The priest had no idea that David was running from Saul. But David then got there and then lied about why he was there. He said, the king has sent me on a secret mission. I have no food and I have no weapons. And the priest said, what about all your men? David had no men. He said, oh, the men are fine too. They're good. And, this, and then lied again about something else. Then he went down in to, uh, to, to, to the Philistines and, and tried to join their army. And then acted like he was crazy and, and lied to them that he was a madman. And they, and they kicked him out. But God kept protecting David because God's will was with David. But he, he lied because he was in fear. But now his lying to Ahimelech is catching up with the innocent, in this matter, priests. And Himelech were helping David, not knowing that by helping David, in Saul's mind, they were participating in what Saul would say was an insurrection. One old country preacher said, when it comes to sin, we like to sow wild oats and then pray for crop failure. <laughs> you know, you plant something over here. You know, you hear that, oh, they're just sowing their oats. Well, you can sow your oats all you want, but it's going to be a harvest. Our sin has consequence. Another preacher said this, chickens always come home to roost. Here, are, here we see two men whose sin has affected others in different ways. Saul's sin of jealousy has caused David to flee. Saul's sin of fear has caused himself to misinterpret David's actions and his plans. But David's fear of Saul has caused him to lie to these priests about why he was there. And, and David's fear of the Philistines has caused him to, to lie and act like a madman so he can survive. So we see jealousy and fear causing these two men to make sinful decisions which pull other people into the future consequences of the sin. We don't often realize how our sin, we think, well, it's just my problem. We don't often realize how it affects other people indirectly sometimes. Even just a little white lie, like David said. Oh, you know, I, I just, you know, this king sent me here for an errand. I don't have anything. Just a harmless little lie. It affects the whole city. Don't always know how or why, but we have to realize that our sin, even things we don't think is that bad, still affects people and there's still consequences. Secondly, not only are there consequences, there is a cost. Our sin has a cost. Verse 11, the king now, he summoned Ahimelech. Verse 12, and he said, verse 13, he said, Why have you conspired against me? Well, Ahimelech has not conspired him against him. But Saul thinks he has. You've given him bread. You gave him a sword. He's risen against me. Why have you done this? Imagine the Hemelech's surprise. One day you're just doing your job as the priest of God. You help David out. Next thing you know, you're before the king being called a traitor. Just like that. Life changes. Hemelech has done nothing wrong. He didn't sin in helping David. He's done nothing wrong. He's just serving God. He's doing his calling. Hemelech verse says in verse 14, Who among your servants is faithful as David? He's your son-in-law. He's captain over your bodyguard. He's honored in your house. Is this today the first time that I have inquired or gone for him? No. He said, don't let you, king, give anything to me or to all the house of my father. Don't impute this sin on me. I know nothing about this at all. All. He says, I don't understand, King. But there's a cost to our sin. And we're about to see what that is. But the ultimate cost our sin bears is the life of Jesus. Look at 1 John 2 2. John says this that he is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. He is the propitiation for our sins. 
And not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. What is propitiation? It means an appeasement. It means to appease someone. It means to be sat, to satisfy something. Right? When you leave here and you're hungry, you have to appease your stomach, doesn't it? To go get some food. You have to satisfy your stomach. Some of us take more than others to be satisfied. Amen. That's what propitiation is. It's appeasing something, but it's not appeasing our stomach. It's appeasing God's demand for justice in the face of sin. When we sin, we broke God's moral law. And so there, there has to be a demand that someone pays. And that someone is Jesus. Our sin costs Jesus his life. When he was on the cross, he, he bore God's wrath upon him for every sin we have committed. God poured it all, not on us, but on Jesus. So we are innocent in God's eyes because Jesus took it all on the cross. So, yes, you might have a, con a consequence in your sin, and that consequence, and, and, and you are forgiven your sin, and there's a consequence, but don't forget the cost of sin. And Jesus took it. Or a cost to him. And sometimes in our own lives, our own sin costs others as well. Look at verse 16. Here's the cost. Here's the cost of David's little white lies. The king said, you shall surely die, Ahimelech, you and all your father's house. And the king said to the guard who stood about him, turn and kill the priests of the Lord, because their hand also is with David. And they knew that he fled and did not disclose it to me, but the servants of the king would not put out their hand. Can you imagine this right here? Saul standing here, all these priests around, all his servants, and he says, go, kill them. And the priest just stood there. There's a cost for that. The servants stood there. There's a cost for that. They're not putting the sword to a man of God, to a priest. You see where Saul's authority has become to where no one listens to him anymore. That's the real problem. But Doeg, the Edomite, was there. And he says, Doeg, you do it. And Doeg turned and struck down the priests. And he killed on that day 85 persons who wore the linen ephod. And then he went to the city and he killed every living, every living thing. One of the biggest atrocities we see God's people ever make. The ultimate cost of David's sin of lying was the sinful destruction of the priests in the city of Nob. Yes, Saul's ultimately responsible. And it's interesting to think that, and, and, and to know this, that in other parts of the scriptures, a couple times it says that an evil spirit came upon Saul and he acted. But it doesn't say that here. This is all Saul right here. You can't say Satan did this one. This is all Saul. Saul and then David as well bore a cost for sin. And innocent people paid. But number three, the good news is that our sin has a solution. Our sin has a solution. Look at verse 20. We see a sliver of grace, a sliver of hope. But one of the sons of Ahimelech, named Abiathar, escaped. How? We don't know. A massacre and he escapes. And he, and he fled after David. And Abiathar told David that Saul had killed the priest of the Lord. And David said, I knew on that day when Doag was there that he would surely tell Saul. And David says, I have occasioned the death of of all the persons of your father's house. Stay with me. Do not be afraid. For he who seeks my life seeks your life. With me you will be in safety again. One priest makes it alive. He goes to the only place he can. He, he runs to David. His only hope. And David does two things upon hearing this news. One, he admits his sin. He takes responsibility of his sin. He says, yes, it's actually ultimately on me that this has happened. He didn't say, well, you know, Saul's crazy. <laughs> I'm sorry. But Saul's, Saul's evil. He says, I knew when I was there, when I saw that man there, that I, 
probably have made the wrong decision. He admits his sin, but secondly, what does he do? He promises safety. He promises safety to this one that had gotten out. David, who is a broken Savior, here he shows both his sinful humanity, but he also shows his place as God's chosen Savior for Israel in Abiathar. David is, is, is a Savior King, and he's meant to point us towards the present and future Savior King, Jesus Christ. That's what his purpose is. Through, through David's response, we see our response to sin. One, when, we, when we've sinned, we acknowledge it. We admit it. We acknowledge that we have sinned, that it has affected our lives, that it could affect other people's lives. We bear that responsibility. But then we don't just stop there and wallow in our guilt. We then run to Jesus and ask for forgiveness and safekeeping, which is what we see happening with the Beatha. Just as Abiathar fled to David, we flee to Christ. We run to Jesus. In him, even though we are guilty, there is peace. There is forgiveness. There is safe keeping. Because those who hate us, as David has said, also hate our Savior. Jesus has promised to protect us, even in our guilt. Even when we disobey, even when we have consequences to what we do, he protects us because our sin ultimately has been dealt with on the cross through Jesus' death and burial and resurrection. Amen? That's amazing grace. Amazing grace. Psalm 103 says this. The Lord is merciful and gracious. Slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. It's wonderful to have a father who is merciful and gracious. Slow to anger. Many fathers are quick to anger. Slow to anger. Abounding in his steadfast love. Verse 9. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, he doesn't repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. And as a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. Why? For he knows our frame. And he knows that we are dust. We have a God that even though we can commit heinous sins, whether it's a little white lie or whether it's the murder of 85 priests, it's all wiped away in God's eyes. There's still consequence. There's still cost. But it's all forgiven. That is Amazing grace. 